Good evening and welcome to another edition of HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark on Sirius XM Radio, Channel 142 HBCU, the pride of Howard University. I am your hostess, Tiffany, and this evening we have Eric, um, Laurel, Dr. Una, and Orz the Morganite. Not quite a full house. Today is actually Winston's birthday and he's living his best life. Um, Today, tonight, we are going to talk about um, a few things in particular, two being student activism and what that's looking like currently um, within this, what, fall 2021 semester. It's been a doozy so far. We are going to talk about... um, the moves or non-moves, action, inaction, non-action of the Biden administration with regard to HBCUs, um, and in particular, the White House initiative on HBCUs. And so later on, we'll also be joined by uh, the former host of the show, Jared Carter, um, for a few words about... um, student activism um, at his current campus, his current um, employing HBCU. So let's get right to it. So down in Alabama, Tuskegee, um, their band has been on strike for more than a few days or boycotting. They're not playing essentially until they feel and have the support that they are requesting. And so I, of course, um, looked into this and it was just interesting to me. Um, before we started recording, I said that it seems that the things that they're asking for, um, in terms of having support for staff, for, um, traveling and things like that, these are needs that adults or adultier adults, people who manage the program should be asking for. The students should not be asking for these things. And so um, I know it can be particularly frustrating as a student to not have what you need for something that requires you to um, perform to the best of your ability to be, to actively be the pride um, of your institution, especially at a game or at a function in your city or your town in this case. Um, to be and not have the, the the tools that you need to be your best. And so I know that the band and sports and all that is really sensitive to, you know, what makes our culture um, unique. Well, yeah, and I so- think I think this is something that probably happens at most campuses because the bands are so large. So we're talking about, you know, hundreds of people, um, be it the from the dancers to the musicians to the staff. And it's expensive. And just like any type of thing that requires money, the school is trying to get the most out of the band as they can while also paying out as minimum and as little as possible. I know the articles that I've seen have spoken about some of the accommodations they've had, some of the issues with travel, um, you know, being able, having it being forced to do down and backs, uh, which is obviously going to somewhere, playing all day, and then getting right back on the bus. Those different things is a challenge, Um, but Tuskegee is a lower resource institution. Um, Even though it has a really great brand, it doesn't have the type of resources, um, you know, as other schools. I mean, their football field is called the shed. So um, because of that, you know, they've cut some corners where they shouldn't have. But I think this speaks to the general theme of this topic we're going to cover tonight about how our schools are forced to make really – it's kind of Rob, Robin Peter to pay Paul type decisions. Um, and, you know, it, it, it puts them in a really tough position overall because you're, you're in one way trying to maximize, you know, your brand to, to maximize revenue. But at the same time, you're really in a tough position because you're not giving the students the best possible experience um, in terms of their accommodation. So it's a, it's rough. I mean, it's no, it's no, there's no nice way to put it. We just don't have the money and, um, we can argue about what we spend money on, but <laughs> it's like the U.S. government. It's like saying we got we don't have the money for education, but we spend money on wars. So it's the same thing. I was 
I was like, so because it does all come down to to money. And I know on my end, I've seen of my alma mater and I've seen of my employing employing HBCU, like they're always like, hey, we need this money. Can you buy this? Do you want to buy this? I'm like, do they not have like a foundation account? Do they not have a body of people, um, former band people, helping to to meet the gap i don't know i'm obviously not 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 a tuskegee alum i don't know i don't have anybody close to me that went to tuskegee so i don't i don't know certain things so that was something i was like really really thinking about like wait a minute um is it really this hard up do they really not have support from anybody whether that is and no it shouldn't come from it shouldn't come from alum more than it should come from the institution. But in this case, if the institution can't meet it, y'all don't have alumni to fall back on. I was confused about that. Um, Laurel or Eric? I mean, I think too, this could also just be a casualty of COVID um, and also adding to the conversation of did people come back too soon and maybe not even maybe, definitely um, administration wasn't as transparent as they should have been about, hey guys, yes, we may have gotten CARES Act money, but we have to prioritize in X, Y, Z ways. And unfortunately, additional funding to the ban program will be cut. And I think a lot of times people in general, including students, would be more understanding if you just tell tell people something instead of just trying to like cover it up or their favorite tactic, which is to be condescending and patronizing and think that, oh, well, you'll just deal with it because it's just, that's just not, it may have worked in the past barely, but it's just like, it's not going to work anymore. And so I think that I don't foresee any of that being undone this year. Um, but I do think that at minimum level, they need to at least meet with the students and even just like acknowledgement, even if you don't get what you're asking for, I think sometimes just being acknowledged and say, yeah, we actually hear you. We understand your concerns and this is what we're going to do. But I also I also agree, like where are the alumni in this, where are their advocates on campus that are student affairs staff like it, this, this really shouldn't be on them. And so I feel like the fact that it's the students leading this charge is also a little bit curious to me as well. So I, I may uh, I have a lot of questions about this whole situation, right? Because in my head, I'm thinking to myself, what is the general profit making model of a band? We understand the importance of bands regarding HBCU culture. It's one of our honestly, uh, it's one of our biggest marketing uh, schemes, right? I mean, not even scheme. It's just so so important in marketing our schools, right? Uh, to the point that non-black schools steal it to try to give that same sense of what we do. Uh, but, you know, to the point of many, um, Laurel and, and, and Ors, you know, when it comes to things that, of, of making money for these things to be taken, is part of it a reflection on a general lack of importance within the arts on college campuses? Uh, does that have something to do with how much money that people intend to put into it uh, to make sure that a form of art, which is performance band, um, continues to, to move forward. There's, there's it's a lot of questions that are there about it. I mean, and to a degree, yes, the students are asking for, for things that, you know, it shouldn't be them asking for it. But also, if the students are the ones to speak up in this situation, uh, would the administrators have said anything? And that's even more problematic because we see them calling for a new band director. Um, and I can tell you from anything, if, if you look at anything in sports, it would be very weird if the entire, of any team anywhere as a whole said, we need a new coach, like they publicly said. So this is a very interesting situation where if the if the band themselves didn't say something about it, there's, there's no way that it was going to, reach the mass. So this was of the utmost importance that it came out anyway. Um, hopefully they get what they deserve 
because quiet is kept in some situations. Bands put people in stands that football can't, football teams can't. So that's abundantly true. Because I promise you, like, no. Um, I just lost my train of thought. But Una, you got it. I mean, everybody made like valid points, and the bigger issue, right, is that. It's been happening prior to there. There's them giving money to I know a few band directors that are at HBCUs and the funding isn't where it should be. You want them to play. You want them to be there. Like what was saying, they play, they get on the bus and they got to go back. It's a lot. And then you're not giving to that particular part of your institution. Why? It doesn't make sense. Like, why are you starving them? Um, so with that said, why aren't not why hasn't this been an ongoing thing where they've been giving money to them in addition to why haven't why are we waiting till now like why why are we just now looking at this because i know several band directors who are like yeah we don't have the proper funding and our uniforms and our instruments and 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 and, and. it's not cool because like eric said it's a major part let's treat it as such One thing like I remember reading and hearing um, is that like there are three major fundraisers, like actual people um, of, of, of any given university or college. And that's the president or the chancellor. That's the athletic director. And that's who that and that's the band director. So in my head, I'm like, they, like I just put in the chat, they ain't get no money. You're not you you're not you're not out there getting money and you're not inspiring people to give. Is this like could this be a thing of we weren't confident in who y'all hired as a band director in the first place? And I don't know. I'm 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 just asking because what makes people not give? And if I'm if I'm being honest about how the context in which I've seen black people withhold their monies, I've seen it at church. You don't like what the pastor did. You're not gonna. You're not gonna pay your tithe. You're not gonna make your your offering. You're not gonna. You're not going to give like you typically would give. And so that's my frame of reference. That's why I phrase it like that. Not that I know anything or that I think anything, because I don't play no instrument. I don't do that. I don't know. Um, but that's just what I think about in terms of how black people like to make a statement. I'm gonna give or I'm not gonna give. So. That's just what I think. Um, now, I, I will say that there are sometimes some issues that take place within our communities, and I'm talking about HBCU communities, and I've heard this before. It's a concept that I call, a, like, uh, you know, you've heard about generational wealth and generational debt, or so it's a thing called a generational haze. So you'll have some people who were part of something on a college campus and you can enter mm -hmm. any category that you want to, right? They went through a particular experience. So those that come after them, it's no yeah. thought process of, I'm gonna help them have a better experience. It's they gotta go through that too, right? Ex you gotta do it because it was bad for me too, right? That same situation, right? That's the only thing that rises to my mind because I've heard it that will be a reason that the former band members, the alumni band members, especially if you have a really deeper connection to a band, like some of y'all have like drum lines, have their own organizations or whatever, you know, yeah. like certain, certain sections. Like you know, eight ball and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. I, and, I can't, and, and I can't speak to, I don't know what what KK Sai or Top Beta Sigma do. So I, I'm not even going to touch that. But just there's a, some people have deeper connections to their band, right? If you're not putting in money to the program that you came through, what else could it be other than that's oh you got to pass down a generational haze? I promise you, you, you whatever you have that you're supporting is never going to progress if that's your thought process. So that's the that's the one thing I I just wanted to add to that. Got it. Um, 
yeah I, any last thoughts on that before we move to um how i'm gonna just say have y'all seen them ban graduation rates they're not can we not get into that well so I so, go in on that. so so, so, so graduation is, and retention yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm just i'm just saying that as i think for all of the people that i, I saw this i went to fam a school known for its band the bands had issues i had multiple friends who were in the band and most of them only make it through maybe one or two years because they have to decide, do I want to be in the band or do I want to graduate? And that's the last thing I'm going to say. Thanks so much, Ors. Thanks so much. Because, wait, what's going on, Una? Okay. Okay, so at this point, it has been however many days, a lot of days, um, that students have occupied the Blackburn Center at Howard University. And well, it started on October 12th, so it's been however long, whatever. And so Obviously, being the Howard woman that I am, obviously being somebody who has written about a lot of different things on Digest, I have not actually written about Howard in this issue since, or right away, I had complicated feelings. I had a lot of feelings, and I just did not do it. I went back and forth with Jared about it. I did not want to do it because I have complicated feelings, conflicting feelings, and I just did not want to do it. So I did not do it until um, after someone from the Digest editorial board wrote, Howard protest is stuck on stupid. And of course, that really did take a lot. And so then I said, well, now I have to address that because that wasn't all the way. It was like, and obviously when you watch this, you're going to see me not use words, but because that's what I did when I was reading like WTF. Um, So it's come to the point where everything is upside down, topsy-turvy. It's a lot. We have to discuss it. Can't run from it anymore. Jared is here because this had a lot of, um, it was a lot. So let me just bring him on so he can say what he got to say because I, I can't. You got it, Jared. <laughs> Welcome that's back. A way, that's a hell of a way to come on. Yes, thank you. Thank you for I having mean, me on. You got it. It's, it's weird not to have the headphones on. I mean, is there a question or are you just what what are we doing? You fully got it. Whatever it is you got to say, you got it. Um, I mean, I, I think there there's a, a couple of things. One, um, to whomever watches this show uh and has been supporting it first, thank you. Um I, I know that Tiffany and the brothers and sisters here appreciate it. Uh, they put a lot of work uh, into doing really, really a good job of covering HBCU issues and even more so, um, you know, since I'm out and have been out for like a month. Um, the first thing I think that I should do is kind of clar- clarify some misnomers, right? Because um, I think before I got to Howard and I did a video kind of explaining, you know, what what was going on. Uh, and what my departure from the digest was. And I think I wasn't particularly clear about what that meant. Cause I've had every question, like, have you sold it? Um, you know, is somebody else controlling it? Uh, what, you know, what is happening with it? So I think the first thing is I don't want people to worry or be concerned about the thing, uh, continuing to publish. I haven't sold it. Nobody else owns it. I own it. Um, still, I just, have completely disassociated from being 
the quote unquote writer or lead writer for it. Um, and I guess it, it, it goes to say like, well, why, why did you do that and, and leave it with such confusion? It's a couple of reasons. One, um, I think like anybody, anybody who's a CEO or creates a business, you get something started. And then there's a point where you realize, Hey, it's off the ground. It's doing what I wanted to do. Perhaps in these fresh ideas, I got to step away. Um, and that time, that time came for me. Um, I had always realized like you can't be one person with your own bias, your own um, background, your own set of values. You know, I'm a 40 year old, what married father of four. Um, I, I can't represent everybody's um, perspective in the HBCU community. Um, I can't represent it from an age range. I can't represent it from a perspective range. I can't represent it from, you know, the various, you know, nationalities who are, who are in our campus communities, uh, you know, the sexual identity uh, that shapes so much of who we are and what we want to do and what we try to do. And it just got to a point like, yeah, you know, you've had, you've had your run G um, and it's time for some other folks to do it. And I think that I called myself being, you know, applying some pressure and saying, well, maybe if I just walk away, that that will that will create some urgency for folks to say, yo, we really got to fill in the gap. We really got to do this because now he's he's up and out of here. Um, and to the point, I think that that was starting to happen, but there still were no controls in place. Um, but to be clear, I'm not I'm, I'm not the, the lead writer. I'm not the voice of it anymore, but I am still the owner. And I think that leads into the conversation about the piece on, you know, stuck on stupid. Um, because as the owner, the proprietor of it, um, that's still on me. Whatever uh, goes up there, whatever rights that I give, uh, whoever can publish, ultimately is still on me. And it never was um, an intention to say, put something out there that's going to that's gonna make people feel bad or, or demean a whole group or you know, make something that's very, very serious seem very trivial. Um, so that that's on me. That's on me. And that's that's there are safeguards in place for sure. Safeguards in place uh, to make sure nothing like that happens again, um, because even when I've taken strong stances on stuff in the past over the last 11 years, um, I can't recall a time where folks was like, yo, you're you're being mean. You're being a bully. Like there's a lot of times where people don't agree with what you say. Um, there's a lot of times where people take issue with what you say. Uh, but it's not to the point where people are saying you you called to my out there name. Or you made an entire generations feel uh, like issues that are matter that matter to them don't really matter. Um, and that's regrettable. And that's that's solely on me. Um you know, you all, my brothers and sisters, y'all are part of a coalition that, um, you know, lifelong friends that I've made um, and people I trust, you know, with this site and with the content. Um, you know, when I said I was leaving, I didn't mean that I was disassociating with it um, or would never come back to it. Uh, I, it just truly meant that I wouldn't be the active voice on it. I won't be an editor. I won't be somebody who's talking. You haven't seen me do this show in a while. I won't do it again after this. My time is up. I'm I'm at Howard, um, and I have full faith and fidelity to Howard University, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. But you know, obviously, I'm not a I'm not an official spokesperson for Howard. Um, I'm somebody who's been a part of, uh, you know, the team for a little more than a month. And one of the things that that I can say, I think that there's so much passion and so much um, ideology about what this whole thing is about. Um, but I can tell you, um, and Laurel can tell you, this is somebody who used to work there. It's a whole bunch of people that really, really care about these young people. And they really, really care about the brand of this institution. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, oh, I like where I work. I like my job. There are people who come in there and will, will come and say, we have to do for these young people. These young people got to get out here and be great. We have to do for this school because this is Howard University. Like there are people, there are people who talk like that on campus. I think that that's not, 
that's not fiction. And so, you know, I, I think that with the entire situation, there are a set of facts. Like you wonder, one, how did the, how did the young people feel that this was the best resort? Or wh- how did they get there? That's a fact that that I think everybody agrees upon, a question that everybody asks. How did we feel that we had to get here? I think that everybody asked the question, including some of the students. What's going to happen long term to the institution because of this? I think even some of the students are asking that because you can see it by the things that they say. We're not doing this to hurt Howard. So I think that they even have a consciousness of the longer this goes, there may be even unintentional or intentional, some collateral damage. What does that look like? You know, not to speak for Howard, but, you know, as somebody who is who's worked in the sector, you see what what things like this look like and not necessarily protest, but any kind of negative publicity, lower enrollment, lower donations, um, a, a lack of, you know, a lack of interest from potential students, um, you know, low morale from people who are on campus. So I think everybody like accepts like some of these facts, right? And everybody who's trying to work through it suggests like we have to start from not just a point of negotiation, but some universal facts about this thing and then kind of work our way out. And so, you know, it's been um, really, really a great privilege of mine to get into, you know, to even be, uh, welcomed into the Howard community as I've been um, and to really catch the fever like you want to do for these young people. Um, as many HBCUs as I've been to around the country, um, having graduated from Morgan, you kind of get a sense of what black brilliance is. And then there's, and then there's another level to it. <laughs> um, and that that's what I have, have found at Howard. And I'm sure that there are other places like that, or as you, you know, you probably have seen that at FAMU. Um, Laura, you, you've seen it at a and um, you, you see the place like Hampton. Um, you even see it in, in, in Winston. It's not on the map like those other, you know, bigger schools, but you see that like there's another level to this thing that we call HBCU. There's another level, another level of fever. There's another le- level of faith and passion about it. Um, and so I, I think with all of that, I think that people are focusing on facts and hoping that we can work our way out of what those facts are going to be, how you get here and what does the end look like? Any y'all, last. Y'all throwing me off the show or is that it? Not any last, last words. Does anybody have any questions for Jared in particular before he has to go? I would say just continue to keep being, keep being cordial and pleasant. I really appreciated your response to uh, some of the tweets you've gotten because, Lord knows, I wouldn't have responded that way. So. No, man. I mean, well, first of all, I'm 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 bison corporate now. Like, there's no, there's, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Um, the se- the second thing is you 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 got to understand like people, people feel very deeply about this. And I think another another fact about this situation is that people feel like this is an extension of other issues. And I think that one of the things that, you know, I've asked myself and other folks have asked, like even some of the students I've talked to um, who are who feel like, you know. I love Howard and Howard is Howard is doing great, but, you know, some people don't feel that way. Um and when they're trying to explore, like, why do some people not feel that way? Um, that there's a disassociation from the expectation of, of, of protest and the expectation of administrative accountability. And everybody has different levels of it, right? Everybody has different expectations. And I think everybody's kind of searching for a level way to say, this is what, this is what, when we don't agree, this is how it should look. And when we want you to be accountable, this is how it should look. And right um, now we ain't there. We're not there. We are not there. <laughs> it's not there. Well, it's just it's, it, it. The, the unique thing about it is that there's so much. Um, there's so much difference between how people feel. 
there, there, there's there, there's like up and down like how people feel about it you know everybody everybody's hbcu there's at some point where students feel like yo we don't like this you know or alumni say yo we don't like that but there's always like a like an even pitch to what to the way that they approach it right right now yeah. we have a pit we don't have a pitch we have a pit <laughs> There's we always like a line, like here's pitch. how it looks when we don't get, we're not getting along with somebody or we don't like something. Here's the line. And the line goes like this at Howard, depending on the group of people you're talking to and the time of day you're talking to them. And that's okay. Cause that's, you know, you said it before to me that that's Howard. <laughs> that's oh, Howard. now you want to quote me. <laughs> now you want to quote me. I mean, I'm glad you're doing it on air because what he's referring to, what he's referring to is how he's learning what being at Howard means. And my response has been, oh, that's Howard. And he's like, no, that's X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, that's Howard. I can't explain it more than that's Howard. And he wanted to argue me down the other day. This is actually yesterday. This is yesterday. <laughs> like, I should show y'all my call log. He wanted to argue me down. Please I'm cut like, all this. Howard. What? Throw me off the show and cut all this. <laughs> no, no, never. We'll never. Um, thank you for coming back and setting the record straight. Um, for what? Third time, second time, one of those times. Um, hopefully this is the last time, man. Because I hope that people will see. Like, I'm not. I'm not writing for Tiffany. I'm not writing for anybody. We are not the same. <laughs> we are not like. There is nobody that can write for me. There's nobody that can speak for me. My own mother cannot do that. Even if I would like to, I can't. I can't do that. There's a, there's a certain, uh, you know, certain level of ethics you want to observe. And I think that there, honestly, there's a certain you can't you can't insult people's intelligence, man. Like I, I mean, if I've been writing for ten years, it ain't hard to tell if I put it ain't hard to tell if I put my name on something. It it really isn't. Um, so I I can't hide I can't hide from it, and everybody know me. So why try? Why lie? Exactly. So are you gonna stay to? Are you going to stay and not speak on everything that we're about to go through? No, I'm out. I'm not. This ain't my show. This is y'all. <laughs> I'm out of this mess. But I just want to make sure, that, first of all, y'all, because I, I love and, and care about y'all, that if anybody wanted to say anything to me, please, I want to answer in front of everybody, honestly. You already know what I'm going to ask. but Why are you doing this what and trying to get ask? fired? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. What you going to ask, Laura? <laughs> About wait, Jared, are you saying about anything in general about what's going on now or about that? Because two different things. Whatever. If I can't answer it, I can't answer it. If I can okay. or I think that I can, I, I will. Okay. Well, then I'm you not asking because I already know you can't answer it. Put it in the chat because I do want to know. So ain't nobody, you, know, you, you getting off. Oh, Y'all love me. I appreciate goodbye. it. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Bye, Candy Corn King. Um, Yeah, so not only am I glad that I am no longer at Howard University, um, but when I was there, I was there for the 2017 protests and also hashtag Tyrone incident. It was a very tough week. Um, and those, both of, all of those are different, including the response, but I feel like the same thing, which is going to happen because I feel like this is, this doesn't stop with Howard. This will probably happen at other HBCUs and other white universities too, because I think we are, we're all in this big pressure cooker and COVID has been the little bow wow finger pressing the violence button. So that's where we're at right now. And I just feel like with Howard and what I've been seeing online, of course, online is very different from what's happening in reality, what is happening in closed, closed door conversations. And 
I don't know. I feel like regardless of, I say this every episode, facts don't matter. When have they ever mattered? They definitely don't matter now and probably won't in the future. So even if there are staff and administrators who do care and who are busting their ass, that doesn't matter because students are upset. Parents are upset. Um, alumni that still have an axe to grind, upset. Um, <laughs> and so it's like you have, I just feel like it's just, it's too many cooks in the kitchen. It's too many people throwing stuff into the gumbo pot. It's not gumbo no more. It is a concoction. And at the end of it, I don't know what this concoction going to taste like. I, with Dr. Frederick, like, I've never been his stand, but I've never hated him. I kind of, you know, I'm just like, he a Trini man. That is how I, <laughs> anything he does or says, I'm like, he a Trini man. Of course he said that. Of course he did that. That's like, that's just not, you know what I'm saying? Like that, but, but everybody does not, this is why intercultural communication is important. Um, but also too, I think when thinking of culture, I think Howard's culture is, we say a lot of campuses can be political, but I feel like specifically for Howard, it is political in the literal sense. And, okay. and I think a lot of people just don't, the average person doesn't know that Howard was chartered by Congress. Because of that, there are individuals, regardless of administration, who have their fingers in that pot of gumbo. Or if their fingers aren't in it, they're in the kitchen, leaning over making sure what's added is what they want to be added. As I always say, it's bigger than Nino Brown, okay? It's it's a lot of other stuff going on. It's bigger than it's bigger than Wayne Frederick, I'm saying. Like and I feel like the smart people are the ones that are like they may hold a certain position but they're going to remain quiet because it's bigger than Nino Brown. You know, especially for my good folks that are still on that Howard pension plan. God bless y'all. Yeah, they're going to be super quiet. So the spookier that it gets, oh, and it's going to get spooky. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. I also think it's interesting that, you know what I'm saying? What are we at? Maybe a year ago, certain people can't put had Howard in their campaign and made sure to note that. And they're really silent and they're an alumna. And I just I just find that very curious. But you know what I'm saying? Again, it's going to get spookier. Um, and as we've just seen these elections on Tuesday, and you know. I'm so sorry to anyone that is from Virginia. God bless y'all. Um, these elections and then the next upcoming elections, again, Howard is political in the literal sense. So beyond students having issues with housing, faculty and other parties having issues with the board, who's on the board, who's allowed to be on the board. I don't know. I think this is just a cluster in that the best, the best strategizer would be stuck. And I don't know, I really don't know how Howard is going to get out of this um, because I feel like no matter what, as, as we all know, no matter what they do, some are going to be mad, some are yeah. going to complain, people will not be satisfied, um, especially people that just have, they do not trust authority at all. So it really doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I feel like, moving forward um they need to really go into the bathroom look at the man woman or non-binary non-binary person in the mirror and have a heart to heart with themselves and be like hey howard what do i want to be in this next century do i do i want to make the lee atwater mistake moving forward because with that issue, which I know Gen Z, you know, they weren't there. I wasn't even there, um, but I read. And so because I read <laughs> um, and looking at that situation, like the optics, that situation was literally almost one to one with what we're dealing right now politically. And that you have conservative members. Um, we did have conservative or Republican administration and how because Howard is political in the literal sense, you can't just tell people to go, you know, don't let the door hit you with a lawyer should have split you. You can't, they can't say that. And that the general public, you know, that they're not satisfied with that and they're stuck on, oh, well, the protests, oh, civil rights, oh, you know, 
freedom fighters and da da da. And it's like, yeah, you can't, you know what I'm saying? You can't be Che Guevara when your institution was chartered by Congress. It, like it's that's just, what people don't, they, it's not, it's not clicking. It's not clicking. It's, it's not, not clicking. They don't understand like we really do have strange bedfellows. Okay. And black people do not have the capital in us. We don't give enough to operate Howard. You don't have enough. And y'all don't pay what y'all could or should be paying. Because we ain't got it. The federal government provides what? 40% of Howard's budget. And, and it's not like President Frederick has not been upfront about that. That's why he got to go out and get the money. Look, I, I remember the pie chart, okay? I saw the pie chart, the State of University address at homecoming while people were shaking their ass on the yard. He was in School of B with his pie charts. It was a lovely PowerPoint presentation, I, I might add. Um, and I think this is, you know, students are going to be students, you know, frontal lobe not formed. But like alum are involved. But alum are involved. Other parties who are not alum are, we know External they're involved. External visitors are involved. External vis visitors, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, I feel, and this is my opinion, I feel that students are being manipulated. I can agree with that. They are the puppets and there are a lot of Geppettos, okay, around here. And to me, it's unfortunate that I don't think there's enough people that are truly advocating for them and what's best for them. I feel like there's a lot of noise and a lot Not of- Not even their own attorney because I've listened to that man and I'm sorry. It's like, I feel like a lot of the noise is coming from people who have no skin in the game. And as Okay, so seen, their degrees is already there. They're not sleeping in Blackburn. They're not in the tents on the yard. They what have no skin in Panama them. right now, encouraging these students. Panama. When I found that out this morning, I said, "Because of course they are. Of course, Panama. This gonna be a I next. Think, this gonna be a Netflix show soon. Wow. You gotta run that back. You gotta like provide some context to who you talk about, Tiffany. Because some people really ain't gonna get this." An alum wrote a long comment on my article. I'm thinking, all right, I'm not going to read all this. But I read it all, and I'm like, all right, let me reach out to this man, because bison courtesy, okay? I want to talk to you, sir. And he said, well, I live in Panama, so my phone is not reliable. I said, scam likely? <laughs> no. So you're literally hyping these students up to occupy Blackburn, to occupy tents, to tell them, don't listen, get your demands by any means, because you was there in the 60s. And you saying they're doing all this from Panama? My guy. Panama? Sunny Panama? I mean, is he at least cash apping them some dollars? I'm just. Saying. I don't know. I didn't ask, but when I when when that became Panama, <laughs> does not compute. I thought it was bad that we had alumni egging them on from from the United States. We international with it now, and it's crazy because. They're like, it's a student center. We could be here. It ain't a residential building and it's not 24 hours. I don't know if y'all even caught today, but <laughs> there was a walkthrough of Blackburn, like a, a, a walkthrough showing how they've been living. Dog. Hmm. Eric or Ona. I cut this right now, Eric. Oh, you're getting to say now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to take a different approach to this conversation. Oh. Okay. And I think to a degree, Laurel will get this. And well, actually, no, definitely, Laurel will definitely get this. And Uno will definitely get this. Higher education is, is a very interesting industry in, this, in the fact that so many of the stakeholders of the industry 
are completely ignorant to how it moves. There are a lot of people who attend college that have no idea how colleges operate. They and I, like that's across the board. It doesn't matter which office you're talking about. They don't know what governance looks like. They don't know what happens when money is donated to the schools. So everybody who went to HBCU feels like they're, they, like they're an expert on how HBCUs work. It's not necessarily true. There's people who literally work in higher education for a living who have no idea how the schools they work in actually work. So I think for me, you know, looking at a lot of this, I'm always a champion for students protesting to get what they deserve because they've been in a mess up situation. I'm never going to be a fan of unprepared protests. We said this before, we said on previous episodes and things like that, right? It is concerning that as we just heard earlier, things are being done. Things are being addressed. There is effort being put in by many of the stakeholders who work on those campuses, right? And to hear that somebody who's not even has nothing to do with modern day Howard at all is manipulating this and possibly has, is involved in some other things. This is is really concerning. Um, I've said this between in our own groups, and I'll say it here. Uh, this is a case study on the dangers of how misinformation gets spread through media, uh, through social media specifically. Uh, Laurel talked earlier about facts don't matter. Uh, we've heard on multiple occasions where people talk about the fact that nobody who's a news source cares about being right. They care about being first. So it's just a it's just a rush to get a story out. It doesn't matter how accurate the story is. It's whatever is more uh, alluring to the eye, and people love drama. Put that story out there. Don't even worry about getting all the the necessary details. I just want us, especially those who who care about their alma maters and care about HBCUs overall. I want us to think more. I want us to vet the information that we're receiving a lot better than we do, because things quickly get to the internet and I promise you there's not going to be a source or citation within 140 to 280 like character tweet like second guess things because honestly if we're not doing that regarding our own institutions then we're no better than people that vote for Glenn Youngkin and believe that you know CO, like <laughs> like that people need to don't worry about uh, a, a critical race theory and have no idea what that even means but they vote against it it's like if you're not going to do your own homework on, on all the information you're getting, then you're just out here spreading rumors. You might as well be a gossip rag. So, yeah. Ors. So I, I think for me, it's just one. I don't believe the protest is about housing. I don't think it's about mold. Um, so I just don't believe that. Cause I don't believe anyone sits outside this long for housing and mold, but I did. I was talking to um, my sister, who's a, a Howard alum, a little bit about it because she was just seeing some of the news and stuff. And um, we were talking about how, like, housing at Howard, how it's kind of evolved over the last, let's say, twenty five years, and how housing really wasn't an issue at Howard in the seventies, eighties, nineties. It really didn't start becoming an issue until DC got expensive. And what happened is, and I hate to say it like this, but many of these students, families who probably have the money would rather the federal government pay for their housing than them. Because you're a landlord in DC is not taking your, you know, your scholarship. He's not taking your your loan, or he or she is not taking your loan. So what's happened is there's become a mad rush to live on campus because then your parents are going to pay for where you live. You can go and get to hit that, you know, hit that FAFSA and that pays for your housing. This doesn't exist at other HBCUs because none, no other HBCUs in a more expensive city. They're not even close. Atlanta is cheap. Houston is cheap in comparison to DC. We don't have HBCUs in New York. Uh, we don't have them in San Francisco and the only PBI, you know, in Chicago is in a cheap part of Chicago. And then, um, even LA is cheaper than DC. So I just think it's interesting, you know, that 
these kids who clearly are smart, who clearly were somewhat high achievers in high school to get into Howard, to be able to go off to college. The majority of them who are protesting are not locals. They ain't from Baltimore. They ain't from D.C. They probably really ain't even from Philly. So, you know, these are these these are kids with a different kind of mindset. I just think it's really I, I really hate to see it. And I would just say this as someone who was born and raised in that city, this is not the time of year you want to be outside um, with that rain and this okay. wind. You know, I just really, really pray that they, you know, get some sense because them tents I saw on you Twitter was 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 flapping, and that wind get up under your under your shirt. You know, they call yeah, it that. You talked about that. They call it that wolf, and uh, that's how much my grandfather called it. So you know, and the Potomac is not forgiving this time <laughs> of year. So you know, I really hope that they find you know find some some refuge inside somewhere. And then lastly. You can have your opinions about De Bruyne and about Frederick, and um, and and they deserve, uh, in my opinion, a large amount of criticism for the lack of leadership they've shown in this. And, and I would say that both of them probably, um, for the last five years, have been mired with these type of challenges with communication, including the Tyrone incident, including this including the housing issues they had when they did the thing with Meridian. It's just so many different things that they've had issues with that they haven't handled properly. So I think they both need to go. I'm not saying they need to be fired, but I don't think either one of them needs to be in the long-term plans of the university. And that's just my personal opinion. Um, as someone who considers himself a Howard stakeholder, my mom was born at the hospital. And you know, that's what I'm going to say. My dad's an alumni. So is my sister. So is my grandfather. So I can say what I want to say. Lastly, I hope that the future of Howard is brighter than this current moment. And, um, you know, I wish Howard, I wish Howard all the best um, as it is located in, in, in my home city. So, you know, go Bison. Let me say this. No, what? A lot, because no, what, to Orz's point, and people have been saying it in, in a, a totally different manner. Frederick should be gone. Everybody should be gone. Board, whole board gone. Because no, no. They don't know how to leave. I'm not cutting you. I'm not cutting you off, Tiffany. I'm not cutting you off. I'm just saying that my point is not saying that they need to be fired for this incident. What I'm saying is that since they've been in power in leadership as the provost or EVP, whatever her title is, and him as president, there have been a multitude of PR incidents they haven't handled properly. It's not. A, I don't believe that oh, they're yeah, at I fault. Agree, I, agree with that. I don't believe that they. I don't believe that they're at fault. I'm saying that the way they've handled the public pressure and the PR narrative has failed the university's image and brand. So it doesn't mean that doesn't mean they're not good operators. They're not they're not good um, academics in fun. leading a university. But part of being in leadership is how you continue to grow the brand and continue to show a public image. And that is where I believe De Bruyne and Frederick have failed not once. But I would say about three times in the last five years at some institutions, that would be enough to have you, you know, get a little buyout and, and gone and, and, and become a dean somewhere else. Shout out to uh, that dean out in L.A. from Bennett College. I'm done. Una, 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 because Oris ain't been back in a month of Sundays and this is what he gives us. Una. <laughs> I mean, but he made some valid points. Uh, the, the one that I was thinking about is that cold, you out there, Thanksgiving is, is coming. So what Head's about to do? Like, real rap, what they going to do? And then if you leave, right, and come back, are you, like, you leave for Thanksgiving and you come back to protest, are we, are we to take you seriously? Are they going to leave for the... Let's think about this because right now I mean I like my mama's penil, so I would want to go home. I want I want to have penil, but how does that look if I'm supposed to be protesting and I leave? Are we having Thanksgiving dinner on the yard? Like what the plan for Ten this? City what Thanksgiving? Not with that wind. Not with that wind. Yeah. <laughs> y'all saw y'all saw them tents. Y'all saw them tents. <laughs> <laughs> for real, like, for, like, let's really think about where we are in the semester. We are twelve days away from them have them 
being able to go home for the rest of, of the for, for the rest of the semester until next semester, right? So till, till January, we know the university is going to close for business for the year. December what? Something, but but students can depart for Thanksgiving and not come back. So in my mind, I'm like, we got two weeks, maybe. Two weeks to get this part, get y'all out of Blackburn. Because let's be clear, and many alum have asked this question, can they arrest them for being in, in Blackburn? Can they? And alum, some alum who are lawyers have said yes. Will they? We don't know. You hope not. Because if you thought you you was complaining about tuition money, do you got bail money? Do you have bail money? <laughs> what you got? <laughs> like for real. So like for this is just uh, because I don't want to see nobody get arrested. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to see a student get arrested. I watch an external visitor get arrested, though, but I don't want to see a student get arrested because I got more. Like I said, there are people I feel like this is like Sherlock Holmes game of shadows. This is a game of shadows. And there are a bunch of people that are manipulating things from the shadows and in person, you know, sleight of hand things. And the students will, if not already are paying for it and. So I would say, you know, Howard and uh, Dell State, you know what I'm saying? Stay woke. They <laughs> it's super woke because it, it might get really spooky and it'll go beyond like the student protest. And and for that, I know we don't have a response. No. We don't. So I don't know, Tiff. I don't know. I don't know either. And I'm about to call it because I'm tired. I'm literally tired. You're going to be editing this month for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, checking and seeing this sh uh, these things, and nothing is changing, and nothing's changing because the administration is like, "Hey, y'all leave, then we'll talk." And they're like, "No, meet our demands. We're being very reasonable." Okay. Any last thoughts? If he ain't got tenure, he need to go ahead and get it. And on that note, thank you so much for watching and listening to HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark on Sirius XM Radio, channel 142 HBCU, the pride of Howard University. Um, we'll be back when we're back. That's all I can tell you at this point. Um, stay safe, y'all. <laughs>